And so this morning, our minister says that performing bands is one of the most memorable and enjoyable things that he does. But I'm sure also speaking from this podium is one of the most enjoyable things that he does. So please help me welcome our minister, our pastor, Reverend John Scott, for this morning's encouragement. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> Thank you uh, Jennifer, and good morning again, everyone. And, and warm greetings from beautiful Jamaica to all of the, those folks who uh, join us in consciousness and watch us on the World Wide Web. Um, if you weren't here last Sunday to hear Reverend Dr. Raymond Anderson, I suggest that you uh, go to the Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living YouTube um, page or our website and listen to him. He was wonderful. How many people were here? Yeah, great, 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 great. Well. One of the things that astounded me about him was the number of degrees that he has. And as I mentioned last week, having done a master's degree at Johns Hopkins University, I, I can't imagine, because I know how much reading I had to do. And then I had to study for the ministry, and I know how much reading I had to do. So I can't imagine anyone doing ten, having 10 degrees. But I have another friend. Um, who I've been speaking to recently, who also has a plethora of qualifications after his name. I think he collects them back home. We used to collect stamps when we were kids. And the difference between him and, and Reverend Dr. Raymond is that he can't get a job. He has been sending out resumes and doing interviews in person and by Skype from Wapiking Hill Philip, as we say in Jamaica and hasn't been able to land, hadn't been able to land a job. And so I was WhatsApping with him, and you know, he was saying, John, I've flooded the market, and I've, I've lost count of how many interviews I've done, and I keep drawing a blank. Now, friends, when I'm speaking to people who are um, of our persuasion, meaning uh, students of truth in the New Thought movement, I, I feel a little more relaxed about, you know, talking about the law of attraction and how we make things happen. It's not a very wise idea to say somebody who doesn't understand that principle, well, it's you that's causing it. You know, if, you, if somebody's in pain, it's not a, a very loving thing to say anyhow, um, although we know that very much our feelings attract our experience. That was in the, in the, in the, the inspiration reading this morning. If you change your feelings, the universe will respond to how you are now feeling. And he was feeling desperate, rejected, unworthy. He actually voiced it. He said, I'm beginning to wonder if I'm worthy of the job that I want. So there was this long silence. I, had, I didn't reply for, it, uh, for a long time. It was so long that he, he texted, you, you dead, eh? Are you there? Eventually, I asked whether he took it personally when he was turned down for a job. And he said, what do you think? Who is being turned down? Me. And therefore, of course, I take it personally. So I said, OK, um, your desperation is undermining what it is you want, because the universe gives you what you are feeling. It gives you more of it. If you're feeling desperate, the universe says, oh, well, you must like to feel desperate. Let me give you something to be desperate for. Do you remember when you were a kid and your you, start, you got a slap and you started crying and your mother or father said, you're crying? You want something to cry for? You, know, you get more of the same. So the universe, I'm afraid, operates the same way. If you have a consciousness of fulfillment and being worthy, you have more and more opportunities to be fulfilled and to feel worthy. So I took the bull by the proverbial horns, and I said to my friend plainly, you have a job to do that is bigger, really bigger and more important than any for which you have applied. You have a job to do on this plane of existence, which is bigger than any job that for which you could have applied. More silence. You know, Reverend Michael Record and I, as you know, um, go to the general penitentiary on Tower Street in Kingston. It's called the Adult Correctional 
um, Center um, every Tuesday, and we do a program called Change Your Thinking, Change Your Life. I like the idea of Michael of Change Your Feelings, Change Your Life, so we will talk more about that. But in our recent, one of the recent classes, we had a, a gentleman who, whenever Reverend Michael or I said anything spiritual that, you know, your, um, your feelings dictate what happens in your life, he would say, yeah, 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 right, that's the frankincense and myrrh. <laughs> you know, cynically. Yes, right, yes, Reverend Michael, don't give me any more frankincense and myrrh, do. And it occurred to me that the gold for which he is looking, and the gold for which my friend who has been applying for jobs all over the globe has been looking, they've been looking for that gold outside themselves. They've been looking for what is buried within them. I don't need any more reverb. <laughs> that gold is within you, my friends. There is no place outside where you're going to find it. The universe has a sign that says, help wanted, apply within. And that is the title of my encouragement this morning. Help wanted. And where do you have to go? You have to go within to find what your purpose is and to begin to serve life in a way that is meaningful for you. And a lot of times uh, at every cohort in the, in the, in the program, at, uh, in, the, in both the male and the female prisons, we work with the participants on a statement of life purpose. And here too in classes at the Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living, we, we sometimes explore that topic. What is my purpose? And a lot of people will say, I really don't know my purpose, you know. It's very important that you get your cosmic job description. And it doesn't have to be erudite and flowery and you know, f full of all kinds of wonderful catchphrases. But you need to ask yourself, why am I on the planet? And when we say to the, the guys at Tower Street, you know, us, why am I here? They say, here? I said, no, you may be here too in the facility to learn something, to teach something, to do something. But the bigger question is, why have you come to Earth? What is your purpose? And this is something that I really want us to think about because that classified advertisement, help wanted, apply within, if you, uh, if you address it in your own mind and your own consciousness, will help to change how you feel about what you are doing in your life and how you are addressing yourself to the whole matter of living and relating to others. You know what happened to my friend? I gave, first of all, I gave, him, I gave him an affirmation, and it is this. I am here on a divine assignment, and spirit is my employer and my, pace, and my paymaster. I am here on a divine assignment, and spirit is my employer and my paymaster. Can we say that together? I am here on a divine assignment, and spirit is my employer and my paymaster. You know what happened in a very short while? He was offered a job for which he had not applied and had not sent a resume. And hear this. His, sta his starting salary exceeded what he had hoped for. So he texts me and says, Obi, you people work that place where you are a pastor. We said, no, we don't deal with Obi. We deal with the power of the mind. It's called, the teaching is called science of mind. And something that is scientific is repeatable. It's provable. There is no, there is no airy-fairiness. If you set your intention, the universe will move. I say universe, you can call it God. Uh, whatever your religious belief is, you can call it anything you want. Yeshua, Jehovah, um, you know, you can call it anything. It's, it's, I love this imagery um, of a, an underground river. 
that feeds all the wells across the world. And those wells are in different countries with different cultures, different languages, different concepts of their relationship with the divine. But it's still one river feeding all those wells. And that one river is God. Call it what you like. I like to move away from the God imagery because it sometimes conjures up the, the, the picture in my own mind of that little remote man up in the clouds, you know, that's looking to slap my wrist or reward me. Uh, so, something external to me. And I love the concept that I learned when I came to this church that God is within me, that I am part of it, it is part of me. We are inextricably wound up with each other. So therefore I call it the universe, but call it what you like. And I want to just share with you that there's an author called Kathleen L. Hawkins who, who co-authored a book um, titled Time Management Made Easy. And she writes, I want to quote you, long before your first professional job, you were hired for another job for something greater and more global than nine to five. She postulates that our real job description is to one, individualized spirit on this plane of activity. In other words, you are already a spiritual being and you, you individualize the universal spirit. You make it unique. There's not another one like you. Two, enjoy unlimited love, prosperity, and abundance. That's your divine birthright. You don't have to go begging for it. It is yours by divine right of being. Three, Live your life creatively and with enthusiasm. Be enthusiastic. Four, contribute something of value to the lives of others and to the society in which you live. And finally, continue to evolve spiritually. You really need to continue growing because when you stagnate, you die. So it is, you know, sometimes I think, well, another class? But really, you know, I've done it. When I, I, I became a minister, I said to Reverend Elmo, I not read nothing more, you know. I am tired of reading. And she said, that's all right, dear. You know, that's all she said. And by the next week, of course, she had given me a book. So to get the job you are not, that you really want, you are not required, or that you really have in divine mind, you are not required to attend any hand-rigging interviews either by Skype or in person, or to provide any references. You get the job because you are related to the CEO. It's a family business, and the infinite spirit of all life is related to you, and you are related to it. And so you get the job simply by being here on the planet to glorify that spirit and to express it in your own unique and wonderful way. So, you know, a lot of people make a lot of money and I sometimes wonder how come some people make so much and, you know, I make so little or I don't make as much as I want. But you know what it is, friends? The people who are making money feel worthy of it. So, you have asked yourself, what am I worth? Just as a little fun thing for yourself this evening, write down for yourself on a sheet of paper what you are worth in dollars, dollars and cents. Um, look at yourself and say, okay, given my talents, my abilities, my experience, what I bring to the table, what am I really worth? So the people who really have that sense of self and have a sense of being worthy what does the universe do? It provides what, what, what they expect. And the other secret is they pick up their paycheck. Do you pick up your paycheck? Or is it sitting there waiting while you say, I don't know, you know, I'm not sure what I want. The people who make it know what they want and they go after it. Joan Borisenko who is the renowned pioneer of mind-body medicine and is an unabashed mystic, says that people who work for God employ, embody a generosity of spirit. They're generous. Um, it, they, they have a natural generosity of spirit. And in her book, Seven Paths to God, she writes, and I quote, 
True generosity of spirit is a hallmark of good managers, teachers, scientists, therapists, mentors, parents, and friends. The highest intention of those who are generous in spirit is to encourage the creative potential in themselves and in others. Because they know they are about God's work, they trust that whatever is needed will be provided. Abundance becomes manifest when one's intention is generous. She says, doors open unexpectedly, strangers come to your aid, and surprise money arrives in time to pay unusual bills or fund important projects, end of quote. According to Borisenko, four things are required to develop generosity of spirit. The first is the intention to serve God in all our affairs. You have to just set your attention. I love, I love when I wake up in the morning to say, just show me what I can bring to life today. Just say that to the universe. Show me today what I can bring to life. And bring to life has a kind of a double meaning for me. Um, you bring something to life that was maybe asleep or dead, an old ambition, an old desire, an old dream you had. And you also bring to life, meaning you contribute to life out of your own storehouse of talent and ability and love and joyous expression. So the first thing is set your intention to serve God in all your affairs. The second thing Borisenko says is the belief that if that intention is honored, the universe will provide all that is required materially and spiritually for your success. Now, you know, Reverend Michael, Reverend Anne, uh, I don't remember if Reverend Sony was there, and myself, we were talking one Saturday morning. We meet every Saturday and we vision for our ministries and for the church, and you know, we discuss the whole business of our, our job description spiritual job description. And we were talking one, one Saturday morning and Reverend Michael himself said, you know, the prison program is wonderful, but it's, it's kind of, I don't know if I should use the word, a niche market. You know, it's, it's a very confined area. You know, you go in, you have um, 15 or 20 people to work with, and it's, it's, it's kind of limited to just that. And he said, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could take this program into, into a, a place in the society which is wide open, that can just you know, spread exponentially, um, because it's such, a, it's such a transformative exercise. That's 11 o'clock one Saturday morning. I kid you not. He leaves here, he makes his way to a meeting at the YWCA, and they're talking there, the head of that, um, of their school leaving program, about their need for a personal development program. And of course, our friend Reverend Michael says, well, we just ha happen to have one right here in my you know, breast pocket, and told her about change your thinking, change your life. We're starting in September. <laughs> Set your intention, and the universe moves. I mean, just amazing to provide it. In the sixth chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, I have to give you a little Jesus because, you know, people say we don't get enough Bible. So let me give you a little Bible. Jesus said in that, in that um, sixth chapter of, of Matthew, and I quote, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust consume and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust consumes, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. End of that scripture. And so the question is, my friends, what do you treasure? What do you treasure? What do you hold dear? My friend was looking for a job defined himself by the amount of degrees he was able to have. That's okay. You know, I admire it. I just think anybody who can, have, who can do that much studying is wonderful. And I just want to know that that can be left as a legacy to other people coming after um, him or her. But what do you treasure? Because <laughs> your treasure is where your heart is. It's, it's, it's really what's important. 
in your life and in your divine spiritual mission on this plane. And so it's okay to, to want the gold. We get the frankincense and myrrh when we come to church on a Sunday. Um, the, the, the wonderful ideas, the affirmations, the teaching. But we want the gold. I want a job that pays. But we need to look within to find the, that vein of gold that is within ourselves that cannot be removed from us. We carry it all the days of our life. So it is a universal law that we receive what we give. There's a woman called Dr. Janet Quinn who um, does work in therapeutic touch. It's called TT. I don't know if you, it, if you are aware of therapeutic touch, this business of using your hands. But the, evidently, in therapeutic touch, the person giving TT sets their intention to, to, to convey the energy of love, of healing, of wholeness to the person receiving it. But her research has found that the person giving the touch receives as much as the person, gets as much as the person that's, that's receiving it. And it's the same thing when we pray in our teaching. When we do a spiritual mind treatment or affirmative prayer, we're not actually praying to something out there. What we are doing is we are treating our subconscious mind to accept the truth that we know about that person, that situation, or that thing. And when we treat our subconscious mind, who do you think benefits? Not only the person or place or thing where we are praying for, but ourselves. Wow. So it is so important for us to just remember that we have an assignment, and it is to produce the best we can for spirit on this plane. Because you see, friends, a, a business produces material goods and services of one kind or another. But in the spiritual business in which you and I have been employed, but which we don't show up for all the time, we don't always show up for work, in that business we are producing feelings, emotions, love, joy, light, compassion, and peace of mind for ourselves and others. So I see our thriving ministry initiative, which you may have been hearing a, a bit about in recent times, over the last year or so actually. And that TMI seeks to engage everyone who attends this center in our mission. You know what our mission is? Let's hear it. To touch, to heal, to bless, to prosper, to love and liberate anyone who comes into contact with us any time, night or day. So you see the next time somebody says to you, that place that you go to on the corner of Seymour and Freeway Avenue um, is what? Say, you know, we are a, a, a people with a vision. We have a vision of a humanity that's awakened to its spiritual magnificence. You don't have to, you don't have, to have anything else to say, you know. And our mission is to touch, to heal, to bless, to prosper, and to love and liberate you. End of story, Jack Mandori. Sometimes you feel awkward because we don't know what to reply. You ever happened to you? People say, explain your church to me. You don't believe in Jesus? And I said, yes, we believe in Jesus. You know, we follow the teachings of the way show. He said, follow me. So we follow, but we honor all paths to God. We think if you're a Rasta, that's cool too. We think if you're a Muslim or a Hindu or a Jew, that's cool too. Because there are many wells across the globe fed by one river. See how easy it is to explain your, your religion? Just say we are a people with a vision of an awakened humanity. Wow! Then when you say, Rati, we never know himself profound. And you say... Come on a, Monday, on a Sunday morning, 9 o'clock, and you'll hear a man called John Scott. And other people who speak the truth. So in the coming weeks, um, you're going to, and months, you're going to be hearing more about um, this thriving ministry initiative, which seeks to touch, to heal, to bless, to prosper, to love, and liberate everyone. And it's being, the move, the initiative is being spearheaded by... Um, Mr. Norman Nair, is he in church today? Okay, so I need to, I need to let him know that he's on the, he's on the spot.
Uh, Norman is chairing the, what we call the, the Thriving Ministry Council. And we have identified four areas of the church's operation um, which we think impacts our ability to fulfill that mission that we, that we just um, expressed. We call them quadrants, four areas. And they are developing the organization, raising consciousness, shifting the culture, and building community. Let me give it to you again. Developing the organization, in other words, putting in place the systems and the, the, the people that we need to run, the, to run an efficient ministry. Raising the consciousness of people, because that's what it all is. The master said, and I, if I be lifted up from the ground, will draw all men unto me. Traditional religion thinks he was talking about his crucifixion. It's not so. He was talking about being lifted up in consciousness to a higher realization of the glory and greatness of that which is within all people. So there's a, a quadrant that will work on consciousness raising. Um, and you're going to be hearing more. And you are invited to get involved and to join one of those quadrants. So I'm going to do two things. I'm going to post on the notice board the names of the thriving ministry council members, and there is going to be uh, a, a sign-up sheet which explains the four quadrants. And I really want you to think about your cosmic job description and your assignment on the spiritual level to become involved. Um, Reverend Raymond Anderson said there was a proposal, that's my proposal, I'm on knee, I'm on, I'm on one knee like, like Johnny Burroughs with the, you know, will you marry me? And then when you, when, you, when you take the ring, it becomes an engagement, right? So them there, they're engaged. But Saturday coming, they're going to have to make the commitment. Wow. And that's the same thing we need to do with our, our work as a spiritual community. Commit. So I want you to do something for me. This is your, your assignment now. When you go home to today, I want you to take your your program and turn to the page with the mission and write it down, but personalize it. My mission is to, to heal. I'm not convinced. My mission is to, to touch, to heal, to bless, to prosper, to love and liberate everyone who comes into contact with me. You see, when you say, thank you, thank you, the universe said, sure. Anytime, night or day. Anytime, night or day. Go easy with the night, or try to get some rest. <laughs> and below that mission statement, I want you to write the following. I commit to support this mission by, I commit to support this mission by, and I want you to write three or four specific ways in which you personally intend to honor this commitment. Assignment? Great, great, great. So finally, friends, I want you just to remember that this, this job that you have doesn't require any commuting. You don't have to worry about, um, it's a job of personalizing spirit on earth. You don't need to worry about the traffic. You don't have to contend with honking horns taxes that cut in front of you. For this job, you need only to close your eyes, take a couple deep centering breaths, and go within. Help wanted. Where? Within. And just allow the power of spirit to energize you, the presence of spirit to strengthen you, and the intelligence and wisdom of spirit to guide you unerringly. So just say, show me what I can bring to life today. For the truth is, as part of creation, you are infinitely valuable. And so to conclude, let's just say it together, as part of God's creation, I am infinitely valuable. As part of God's creation, I am infinitely valuable. I'm a thriving ministry. I play a vital role in the universe. And to the neighbor, to your neighbor, say, the universe needs you. You have got the job. Congratulations. The universe needs you. You have got the job. Congratulations. The universe needs you. You've got the job. Congratulations. Listen to me. The universe needs you. You have the job. Get up and come to work. Congratulations. Namaste.